It's great to see so many of you here. Um, I'm Hiranya Perez. I'm the director of the Oscar Klein Center for Cosmocardial Physics. And the OKC is a collaboration between Stockholm University and the Royal Institute of Technology. Um, we bring together particle physicists, cosmologists, and astrophysicists. And we try to tackle some of the most mysterious and exciting questions that we have about the universe. So it's one of the best places in the world to study the dark universe, which is the topic of tonight's event. Um, we are very pleased to offer this public event to the Stockholm community. And this is on the very special occasion of our 10th anniversary celebrations. So we will now have a public lecture uh, by Professor Catherine Fries. And it will be followed by a discussion between Professor Fries and also Professor Sean Carroll. So, Professor Catherine Fries is the Professor of Physics at Stockholm University and also the George E. Uhlenbeck Professor of Physics at the University of Michigan in the United States. She holds an honorary doctorate at Stockholm University and she's the author of the book, The Cosmic Cocktail. She's one of the world's foremost experts on dark matter, dark energy, and the physics of the Big Bang. Professor Sean Carroll is the professor of theoretical physics at the California Institute of Technology, also in the US. And he is the author of many popular books and also the blog, The Preposterous Universe. He specializes in quantum mechanics, gravitation, cosmology, statistical mechanics, and the foundations of physics. So I'm delighted to welcome on stage now, Professor Catherine Fries, who will talk to you about the dark matter in the universe. Well, thank you, Hiranya, for this lovely introduction. And I just want to check the, that all the, the sound is working, and it's, that's good. So Hiranya, you, you uh, took some of the words out of my mouth. I wanted to say a few words also about the wonderful Oscar Klein Center. So if you look in this picture behind me, this white building, that is where a lot of the physics of both Stockholm University and KTH reside. So if you walk in here and you go, keep going straight to the back, that's where some of the best work on dark matter and dark energy in the world is taking place. So in fact, that's, that's why I relocated for a significant part of my time to Stockholm to work with this wonderful group here. And I do want to highlight some of the work that's going on in Stockholm during my talk. Let me start with a philosophical comment. So throughout history, people have wondered about our, or, our origins, where do we come from? They have creation myths for what the beginning of the universe might have been. And the remarkable thing is that 100 years ago, we came up with the idea of the Big Bang. And this is more than a myth. This is reality. So we've solved some of the outstanding questions of humanity that existed since antiquity. Now, all of this began with the work of Albert Einstein in general relativity in 1915. And soon after he wrote down his equations, other people applied them to the universe as a whole and realized there were three possibilities for the universe. It could be contracting, it could be expanding, it could be static. Einstein had his favorite. He really liked the idea of a static universe which would be the same at, at all times in, the, in its history. But then soon after, in 1929, there were measurements made that contradicted this. So Edwin Hubble was using the telescopes in Los Angeles. And in fact, when I had a, um, a sabbatical at Caltech, which is where Sean works, you could see those mountains behind you. But it's not until you try to bicycle up there that you realize. <laughs> so there, it's, it's, it's as high as, as the Alps or whatever. It's really high. And so there were telescopes on top, the Mount Wilson Observatory. And Hubble made some incredible contributions to our understanding of the universe. 
for one thing, until the time, I mean, it's amazing, at the time of the great theoretical advances of Albert Einstein, still everybody thought that there's only one galaxy. They thought that all those stars that we see out there are part of our Milky Way galaxy. And it was only the work of Edwin Hubble that showed that, no, no, some of these things are just too far away. There must be more than one galaxy in the universe. The other major contribution that he made was by studying atomic emissions, he was able to show that if, if you look in galaxies, that he was able to show that those atomic emissions had changed by the time they got to us. So if I take a balloon and I blow it up, and I draw a wave on these balloons, the length of those waves stretches. And that's exactly what he observed. Because you know the wave of the, of the atoms, you know at the time it's emitted what that wavelength is, and then you compare to what you measure today. The conclusion was the universe must be expanding. And that's not what Einstein had originally wanted, but that's uh, nature trumps our ideas for what the universe should look like. So to show a sort of simple-minded slide of this, galaxies are moving apart from one another. So from our point of view, all the galaxies are moving apart, or if you went to a different galaxy, they would see everything moving apart. I, don't, I of course, don't mean locally. I don't mean on very small scales. I mean, we are actually about to merge. In, in the long run, we'll merge with one of the neighboring galaxies. But on large enough scales, everything's moving apart from everything else. The cosmologist's conception of the Big Bang is that the universe started very hot and very dense, about 14 million, oops, no, 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 14 billion years ago. It started out in a primordial soup of fundamental particles. I've drawn a few of them up here, so don't worry about what they are, but the point is they were very, very tightly packed together. The universe was very hot and very dense, and since that time, it's been cooling and expanding. So eventually, these very densely packed particles move apart from one another, and if I wanted to show a simple-minded picture of this, it might be a, raisin, a piece of raisin bread. So here the model is that the raisins are like the galaxies. And if you take the dough, you put it in the oven, then that dough is going to rise. And it's not because the raisins are doing anything, they're not running anywhere, but it's just because the underlying raisin bread is expanding. So you can think of this as a model for the universe, where galaxies are just being stretched apart from one another by the expansion of space-time. Now, one major difference between this raisin bread and the universe is that the raisin bread has a central point, but we don't think that our universe does. We don't think there's any special point at all. So not, the, the Earth isn't special, the Sun isn't special, the galaxy, even our galaxy isn't special. So as I said, if you went to some other galaxy, you would also see all the other galaxies moving away from you. So people have the, the, the uh, idea somehow that the Big Bang all started at a point, and I want to I address that, and I want to say, no, that's really not the right idea. So in fact, if we take our universe, and let's go backwards in time so everything gets more and more compact, then of course, if you do that as you go back in time, then everything in this room would contract to a point. But what if the universe is infinite, which is very possible? Then, yes, everything will be becoming closer and closer together, but no matter how far you put things closer and closer together, the universe would still be infinite. So in that sense, the Big Bang was not, well, first of all, it wasn't an explosion at all. But if you want to think of it as an explosion, then please put one at every single point. So the Big Bang is really a, a point in time, it's not a point in space. So where do we stand in cosmology today? A lot of the big questions from 100 years ago have been answered, and that's just unbelievable to think about that. So the, uh, this, this Big Bang picture, we know it's right. It's incomplete. We have a lot of work to do, but we know, it's, we know the basic picture is correct. We also know some of the big questions that were answered, that were asked 100 years ago. What is the geometry of the universe? What's the total mass and energy content of the universe? How old is the universe? About 14 billion years. 
And I wanted to say a little bit more about how, what we know about the shape and geometry of the universe. So I was mentioning that there are three different possibilities for the shape of the universe. One of them is, well, by the way, these are lower dimensional pictures that I've drawn. I can't draw the entire universe, obviously. But so if you were to draw a low dimensional version, it could be that we're sitting on the surface of a sphere, or we could have a saddle, or flat geometry, but then when I say flat geometry, I just mean that take everything out to infinity in all directions, and there's no curvature to, to the universe. And in the 1930s, it was unclear which of these was right, and now we know what the answer is. So let me show you one of the differences between these different geometries. So if we're living on the surface of a sphere, then if you send a light beam out, and it's obviously not really going to happen, but if you were able to do it, then it would come back, you'd send it out, and it would come back and hit you from behind. But, you know, our universe is too big for that, so it's not going to happen. But in principle, light rays have bizarre behavior in these other universes, whereas in the flat one, light rays travel in a straight line in the way that we're used to. So we now know that the answer is that we have this very ordinary geometry, no curvature to the universe. And we know this from studies of the microwave background, which is the leftover light from the Big Bang. So I'm showing you a picture here of the universe from the point of view of microwaves. So the, there's microwaves everywhere that are flooding to us. They're coming to us now from very, very early in the history of the universe. And they're telling us an enormous amount, in particular from the size of these hot spots and cold spots, we learn about the geometry of the universe. So if the size of one of these spots was about one angular degree when you look out into the universe, that would tell you that the geometry of the universe would be flat. And sure enough, there you go, this is one angular degree and that's where all the action is, it's on, on one degree. So the, we know the geometry of the universe is flat. And again, I don't mean that it's a two-dimensional universe, I just mean you take a cube and you take each of these sides and stretch them out to infinity and you don't have to have any weird curvature to describe it. So I, just, I also want to make the connection between the flat, flat geometry and the amount of mass and energy in the universe and we now know the answer is about 10 to the minus 29 gram per cubic centimeter. That's in an average place in the universe. Water on Earth is one gram per cubic centimeter so we're off by we're, we're, we're more dense by a factor of 10 to the 29. So before, oh, I, I, if somebody asked me later, I'll tell you the story about how I tried to describe outer space to Queen Sylvia and I failed miserably, but anyway. So before I leave the subject of the microwave background, I do want to point out here, this is an, um, from the earlier US satellite, the initials of Stephen Hawking, and yes, that's not, that's a joke. Now, I did want to mention, he, locally, some of the people are doing amazing work here on the cosmic microwave background, and so you've already met Hiranya Paris with a quote behind her. When I saw the first data from the Planck satellite, I couldn't wipe the smile off my face for a week. And sabbatical visitor Will Kinney, the two, the, the, these, these are some of the best people in the world for thinking about inflationary cosmology really, really sh soon after the Big Bang and testing it with microwave background data. We also have young people, postdocs and students, who are really, really good here in Stockholm, and they're working on, this, on these problems. That leads me to the question that I'm, I'm focused on today. What is the universe made of? And that's where things get really strange. Here are the things that we don't know. So if you take yourself, your body, the air, the chair you're sitting in, the, the walls of this beautiful room, the earth, the stars, everything that you know, all made of atoms, all of that adds up to only 5% of the universe. That's pretty strange, pretty, it's a big surprise, and we have to figure out what the rest of it is. So we know that roughly 5% is ordinary stuff, 25% dark matter, and 70% dark energy. And yes, the dark matter is the subject of my book, The Cosmic Cocktail. So this dark matter problem is now 80 years old and we have to solve it. Uh, before I came to Sweden, I wasn't aware that the, what, the person who first noticed this was Knut Lundmark in 1930. In, uh, 
so a Swedish scientist, and then Fritz Zwicky, a Swiss scientist, also working in these same mountains in Los Angeles. Um, and so I'll tell you about Fritz Zwicky's work. He noticed that galaxies inside a cluster were moving too rapidly. So you've got a cluster, lots of galaxies, but some of them are going really, really fast. And that means something must be pulling on them to make them move that fast. If it's not stellar light, there's not enough stellar material to make them move this fast, then perhaps it is dunkle materia, the German for dark matter. And when we say dark, we simply mean that it doesn't shine. It doesn't give off light. By the way, a story about Fritz Zwicky in his book. So he said he called his colleagues spherical bastards because no matter what direction you look at them from, they're still bastards. So I, sh I shouldn't tell these stories, but I have more stories. Sean, let's tell more stories later. But anyway. So there was, there was a, um, a, a lot of people making measurements, and it was really in the 1970s, the work of Vera Rubin and Kent, For Kent Ford that absolutely nailed this, because they looked inside galaxies, and every single galaxy had the same behavior. Things were moving too rapidly. And that's when the scientific consensus really became, wow, there, there's dark matter everywhere. It's not just one cluster, it's really everywhere. And so I'll, I think I'll just go ahead and show you what our Milky Way looks like. So at the center of the Milky Way, there is a giant black hole that weighs a million times as much as the sun. Then as you move out along these arms, that's where the stars are located. And so for example, you can see the sun along one of them. So when we look into the sky and we say, oh, we're looking, we see our galaxy, we see the stars in our galaxy, that's where they are. But now we take this and look at it from the side. And here's the center, here's our sun. All of that is only the tiniest part of the galaxy and an artist's rendition would show it to be something more like this. So here's the spiral arms with the stars, but then there's this big giant spherical object, called, we call it the halo of the galaxy, made of dark matter. So most of the galaxy is made of dark matter and it was first noticed because if things move around too rapidly, something has to be pulling on them gravitationally to speed them up. Then another way we know about the existence of dark matter is, again from Einstein, it's lensing of light. So I'll show you this slide, mass, mass bends light. So for example, here's the sun, and here's the Earth with, with our telescopes. So if this is a star, then the sun bends the light on its way to us, so we might get the wrong idea about where this star is. But it gets even more strange because you can end up, because of any dark matter is going to bend the light on the way to the telescope, you can end up with multiple images of the same thing. So here there's two images of the same thing, and they're in the wrong place. There's two of them, and they're stretched. They're sheared. They look little, a little odd. You know, there's an app uh, that you can get if you have an iPhone. It's, um, it's a gravitational lensing app, and you can lens yourself. And this has me, as you go, you can lens yourself more and more, and there's my, my uh, graduate student lensing himself. Anyway, so let's turn to some real data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And, yep, these are, there's some foreground mass that is lensing background galaxies, and look at that. There's all kinds of sheared images in there, and I don't even know all the details, but this is a lot of lensing going on in there. So what you can do now is, given the data, you can ask, okay, what mass did there have to be in between these bright galaxies in you to figure out what is, so what is, you can get the distribution of the dark matter that's on the path between the bright object and you. And by doing that, you get images like this one. Although, let me just say, the, this image does not correlate to the next one, but it's, they're both beautiful pictures, so I'm using them. So here you have, um, the, by, with a computer reconstruction of the mass in between the background light and you, you can see there's a lot of galaxies in here, but there's even additional dark matter between the galaxies, so clusters even have more dark matter in between galaxies. So I've talked about two ways we know dark matter exists, and, Here's a third one. This is the famous bullet cluster. So what's, what's going on? We think what's going on here is that you have two clusters of galaxies that are 
merging with each other, and they already had their first collision, and when they went through each other, the gas, which is shown in pink, got stuck. So that's seen from X-ray observations. We know that there's, there's gas here. But then we also know from, again, from lensing measurements that something else kept going, and that's the, the stuff shown in blue. So this is weird. So what we're learning from this is that there really are two different types of mass. There's, t there's mass that gets stuck, and there's mass that keeps going. So we think this, the gas here, it has all kinds of interactions. But the blue stuff the dark is as what's shown in blue there. The dark matter does not have these interactions. It doesn't have electromagnetic interactions because it doesn't give off light. We don't think it, it doesn't have strong interactions that hold your nuclei together. So it's behaving very differently from the atomic material. So I've shown you a number of ways that we know dark matter exists from the work of, of the rotation curves, the gravitational lensing, and the bullet cluster. I wanted to show you one more because it's, this is kind of fun. It turns out that without dark matter, we actually wouldn't be able, able to exist. The dark matter helps galaxies form quickly enough for us to be able to come into existence. So what this is, I've got a series of slides. And the universe started out pretty much homogeneous, but some regions had a little more mass than other regions, and those, ma those regions collected even more material. And so you, you see stuff that's pretty much uniformly spread out, but then wherever there's mass, it pulls in more and more and more. And so as time goes on, the dark matter is shown as these blue points, so the dark matter collects together until you reach today. And we think this is a, this is an Amer a computer simulation that matches reality rather well because we have these long filaments of structure. And at the nodes of the filaments, that's where the galaxies are located. But all this entire process only works because dark matter clumps a lot more quickly than atoms would have been able to. And then the atoms fall in later. So we need dark matter to make the structures for the galaxies in order for us to be able to exist. Well, our pie chart is still, although we, we know these numbers really well, it's, we call it the age of precision cosmology. Well, that's nice, but what the heck are these things? So we do know that a lot of things the dark matter is not. It's not rocks or dust, otherwise you'd know. It's not small stars, planetary objects, white dwarfs or neutron stars. That's some of the work I did. And we are left, well, we're left wondering what is it. And what, what we think is the most likely is that it's some new kind of fundamental particle. And I mean new in the sense that we haven't discovered it yet. I've listed here some of the candidates for dark matter, and also in red some of the local people who are working on these things. So I can just tell you right away, neutrinos, oh, that would have been great, they exist. Why can't they be the dark matter? Well, the answer is they're too light, that they don't make up enough of the mass of the universe. So there are many other interesting candidates, including primordial black holes, um, the work of Florian Kunel, who's a postdoc here. Uh, I'm going to focus on the two best candidates for dark matter, the axions and WIMPs. The reason that I say they're the best candidates is because they weren't invented just to solve the dark matter problem. There were problems in particle theory that required solutions, and those solutions automatically give you these candidates. I don't have time to talk about all of this in great detail, so I just want to mention axions or was one possibility, and this was an idea invented by Frank Wilczek. Nobel laureate, and also, he also spends half his year in Stockholm. He has a similar grant to mine. Invented by him and by Steve Weinberg, and there are searches underway to look for axions. This is a really hot topic over the next five years. Very light particles, but they're not moving very fast, so they're, they're great dark matter candidates. So I want to focus on the other top candidate for, for dark matter, and these are WIMPs, and WIMP stands for weekly interacting massive particles. So what, what, what does the name mean? Well, let me, so of all the, f the interactions that we know about in particle physics, we've already talked about what the dark matter cannot have. It cannot have strong interactions or electromagnetic interactions. Well, there's one left, and that's the weak interaction. It's a weak force that's responsible for some types of radioactivity. So. If dark matter is made of WIMPs, there are billions going through you every second. 
but they're not doing anything to you because they're weakly interacting. Now, the downside is because they're so weakly interacting, they're really hard to detect, and that creates an entire field of experimentalists that I hope to be able to tell you something about. Um, I, I should tell you what, how heavy they are. They weigh about as much as a proton or 100 times as much as a proton. And what, one of the other reasons we like them is because they're automatically in theories of supersymmetry, which I don't have time to talk about, but it, for every, if, if supersymmetry is right, then every particle we know about, there would be a double. There would be a, uh, the, a partner. And the lightest of these partners may be the dark matter. So I do have to mention some of the people here who have written the, the computer code that everybody uses to calculate the dark matter particles that are part of supersymmetry, this dark Suzy code. Um, Lars Bergstrom, and he was the founding director of the Oscar Klein Center, and he's right here in the second row, so yay, Lars. And yes. <laughs> For, for, uh, thank you for all your, all your work, both with, uh, scientifically and for the OKC. <laughs> and the, the other uh, person who's on the faculty here playing a major role in this dark Susie is, is Joachim Edzher. I don't know if he's here, but uh, he's okay. Anyway, so wanted to mention that. And also the many, many students and postdocs at Stockholm University who are working on these problems. And I've shown some of them here. And so that leads me to say, to, well, we've talked a lot about the theory, and Stockholm and, and the OKC not only has the, has the best theorists in this area, but also has, is involved in the searches, all the different kinds of searches for these particles. Now, one way to do it is to, to go to the particle accelerators. This is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva. And what's happening here is you're accelerating protons in opposing directions. And so I like this slide. So it's 100 meters underground, and you've got protons moving in opposite directions, and then occasionally they're steered into each other, you get a collision, you study those collisions, and you look for supersymmetry. A few slides of some of the people here. This is Fabiola Gianotti, who she's now the whole director of all of CERN. Just to give you an idea how big these things are, there's somebody standing there, and that's, the, that's one of the detectors. And here's Peter Higgs in front of the other detector. You may have heard of the discovery of the Higgs boson. So there it is, this little bump here. This is something that weighs about 100 times as much as a proton. And this was the last missing piece of the standard model of particle physics. And the other, if, if, if I, I were to say, if, what is the other major goal of this particle accelerator? Well, of course, finding anything new would be exciting. But also the discovery of supersymmetry is something they're really after. And we hope that happens. No, it hasn't happened yet. Now, there's another way to look for these particles, and that is in underground laboratories. We call it direct detection. So what happens here is that you have the nucleus that makes up your detector. There's your detector, and along comes the WIMP. It hits the detector, and it heats up the detector a little bit, and you have to detect that deposit of energy into, into your nucleus. And it's very, these experiments are very difficult because it's not a lot of energy deposited. They're very, very weak force, as we were saying. It, it doesn't happen very often. So it's, these are very difficult experiments. And so I, I, I'm not going to tell you at length about how I got into the dark matter business, but it was at a winter school in Jerusalem, and this man who speaks English, French, Polish, German, but all at the same time, but I did listen to him anyway, and we ended up inviting him to Harvard, and we got involved in, in, in theoretical calculations of trying to figure out, okay, if you, have, if you were to build these detectors and some wimps from the galaxy were to come along and bounce off, what would you be able to see? And so we did some calculations, and sure enough, this, these experiments are now happening. I think I'll show that slide first. They're happening all over the world now. Um, so there you go. These are the experimental labs these underground laboratories. And in particular, this is one that Stockholm is involved in. This is the xenon experiment. There's Jan Konrad. So th this is um, underneath the Apennine Mountains outside of Rome. There's a deep, we're talking a kilometer below the Earth, um, a deep underground lab, and that's where the experiments have to reside. Oh, why do you have to go underground? Because otherwise, cosmic rays swamp your detector. 
So I don't know if you know that all flying around everywhere, there are, from the galaxy, there's particles that are hitting us. And so if you go up, uh, up in an airplane, you're less protected from, by the atmosphere, and so you're hitting, getting hit by a lot of cosmic rays. So I don't know. Flight attendants don't seem to get more cancer than we do, but anyway. <laughs> If you're pregnant, don't fly over the North Pole because the magnetic field attracts all the cosmic rays. So you're, I'm, that I'm serious about. But anyway, so um, there is one experiment out of all those that I showed you worldwide. There's only one that has a signal and it's very strange. What they're, what they're looking for, as the Earth moves around the sun, the amount of signal that you get should go up and down. So you should get more counts in June, less counts in December. They've been taking data for 13 years, and it's exactly what they see. OK, so does that mean dark matter has been discovered? Well, no. We don't know what's going on for two reasons. So one of them is that these people will not share their data. And so that's, very, that's not the scientific norm, so we don't know what to think. And you can read this quote if you want. It's a little strange on their web page. But the main problem is comparison to other experiments because the other experiments don't see anything. In fact, here are the leaders of some of these experiments. We've got Juan Colliar of the Cogent, Elena Prile of, of, the, of the PI of Xenon, and Rita Berenabe, she's the, the DAMA experiment that has the signal. And Juan is a lot of fun. To quote him in this case, I'm a Spaniard caught between two Italian women. Anyway, so, th but the, 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 this, it is true that these other experiments don't see anything, so we don't know whether the DAMA experiment is right or not. But we do have fun at meetings. <laughs> so I have to show a few slides. If you're a student interested in going into this business, he's the, the head of the Lux experiment. That's Rick. So anyway, this, the meetings are fun. OK, so to, if you want to, so to test DAMA, what you have to do is build another experiment made of the same material, because DAMA is made of sodium iodide crystals, but the ones that don't see anything, like xenon, is made of xenon. Um, and so maybe that's why you see something in one case but not the other. So what you have to do is build more material that is identical to what DAMA was using. And that is happening. In fact, one of the experiments, cosine 100, has a working experiment. So within three to five years, we'll know whether or not dark matter has been discovered. So that's, uh, that's a, an exciting thing coming up. So in the meantime, we've been working on a number of uh, futuristic ideas for dark matter detection. I'm going to mention this one. So here we have a plane of gold. This is nanometer thin plane of gold. And you have DNA attached. Yes, you can use DNA to, to as, as dark matter detectors. Now, how, how the heck do you do that? Well, DNA is not going to break because it's hit by wimps. because Otherwise, you'd, we'd all be dead. However, if a wimp comes along and hits the gold, it'll knock the gold nucleus into the DNA. And now the gold nucleus can break the DNA. And DNA has a beautiful, is, is a beautiful thing. You can control exactly what these strands look like, A, C, G, whatever. And by collecting these strands down here and making billions of copies of them, you can reconstruct the track of this recoiling gold which means you can figure out also where the wimp came from. And that gives you a directional signal, which is really helpful, because we expect more wimps in one direction than the other. And so this is a really great way to figure out, to show that what you actually know what's going on. So this, these experiments have a directional, directionality that some of the others, most of the others don't. Well, so I talked about accelerating protons and creating wimps. I talked about taking advantage of the wimps in the galaxy to hit nuclei as, as they come through our detectors. There's a third approach that we call indirect detection. And that is to look for annihilation products of wimps. I didn't say this earlier, but wimps are their own antimatter. And so whenever they hit, voomp, they, they're gone. They turn into something else. And you can look for that something else. So if you look in places where there's a, really an overabundance of wimps, like the center of, the gal of our galaxy might have extra wimps in there, then you might be able to see annihilation products. And those annihilation products, in the end, would be neutrinos, high energy particles of light called gamma rays, or positrons. And again, Stockholm University has played a major role here. The ice cube detector, 
that was, it's in, uh, it's at the South Pole. So here's the ice. And you go down 2,400 meters to the bottom here. So there's, and this is where these, these strands of phototubes are dropped down into the ice and they flash when a neutrino hits them. So these are wonderful neutrino t detectors. Um, Para Olaf Hulth, without him, this really wouldn't work as well because he, he built the deep core that goes deep on the inside here. Um, unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. And Ch Chad Finley is now the group leader for the, the local Swedish uh, effort. And here we have the, this is what you see above the ice. So no discovery of dark matter neutrinos yet. But they, they, the, this ice cube experiment has found really interesting high energy neutrinos that are not explained. So other interesting stuff coming out of that experiment. The, the, uh, the other way to look for, you look for photons, high energy particles of light that came from annihilation and the Fermi satellite. This was something, again, that Sweden played a major role in getting this started. Lars was one of the players in this one. and, and um, this is what they see. This is the gamma ray sky, and so this, this is the plane of the Milky Way, and there's these giant, interesting bubbles that are the, that astrophysics that people are learning that are not relevant to this talk, but interesting. But at the very center, there's a small spherical region where there are excess photons that could be from dark matter annihilation, and we don't know. So anyway, there's possible evidence. We haven't solved the problem. Otherwise, you know, you would know. You would have heard about it, and there would be Nobel Prize and so on, but we're working on it, and... So that we have this excess in DAMA, the, in this um, Italian experiment, and you have this excess in high energy photons coming from the center of the galaxy. And on the, the theory side, we have to, theorists have to figure out how to accommodate these different experiments and figure out what's going on. In the end, of course, what is gonna have to happen is more than one group sees the same thing and these, conf these interesting personalities are going to have to agree on things. Okay, that leads me to my baby that I have to tell you about, and that is dark stars. So, we called them dark stars before we knew about the movie, which, uh, yeah, you can watch the movie. <laughs> um, so, this was an idea that the three of us invented. This is um, Doug Spoliar, Paulo Gondolo, and me. And the idea is that the very first stars to form in the history of the universe, this is when the universe was 200 million years old, they could have been really weird. So in, in the current stars, the power source is fusion at the center of the star, hydrogen getting together and fusing to make helium. However, in these early stars, they would have been very, very weird. They would have been, there's no fusion, they're very cool and they're powered instead by dark matter annihilation. So the idea would be that you would have a collapsing cloud of hydrogen in the early universe at the center of one of these giant proto-galaxies made of dark matter. And as the hydrogen collapses, it pulls in more dark matter. You get more dark matter annihilation. Those annihilation products get stuck and they end up getting, they stay there and they heat up this thing. It becomes a star. And it starts out weighing about as much as the sun, but it can grow bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes a million times as massive as the sun. And then you've got a really bright thing that may be a billion times as bright as the sun or more. And you can see that in principle with the next space telescope. The sequel to Hubble is called the James Webb Space Telescope. And our hope is that they will discover dark stars. Now, another nice thing about dark stars is when they, when, once they run out of dark matter fuel, they will collapse to black holes, and there are supermassive black holes all over the place that people don't know how to explain. Not only at the center of every galaxy, not just our galaxy, but every galaxy has one, but even very early in the history of the universe, you've got these giant supermassive black holes. So if you start out with dark stars that became big black holes and they could merge together to make these really, really supermassive ones, that might be an explanation for that observation. So there's many ways to look for, for these particles and good chance in, of detection in the next decade, all the different methods that I was telling you about. But I haven't said anything yet about the really strange one, the 70% dark energy. So first of all, dark energy and dark matter probably don't have anything to do with each other. The only thing they share is that they're dark, they don't give off light, okay? so. 
but what does dark energy do? Well, it is something, we don't know what, that causes the universe to accelerate. So not only are galaxies moving apart from one another, but they're, they're accelerating apart from one another. So that, is, that was a discovery at around the turn of the millennium that really surprised people. And on the theory side, we don't know what to do with it. Does it mean there's some kind of vacuum energy? Is Einstein's cosmological constant back? By the way, he put it in originally to make a, a static universe, but it turns out it can, uh, in different circumstances it can cause an accelerating universe. So Einstein's cosmological constant is back on the theory side. Or does it mean Einstein's equations need revisiting? And I'm sure you can all talk to Sean about that. <laughs> Sean Carroll about that. But, and now on the experimental side, what we are going to start to learn is whether or not this dark energy is constant or whether it changed in time as we look backwards. So, so we're all hoping to get some more information from some upcoming observations. Um, but since I don't have an answer to this question, I'm just going to end with a joke. So this is at the World Science Festival in 2011. I was on a panel with, let's see, there's me with Dr. Elena Prile, Glennis Farrar. We were, we were talking about dark matter. And over here, talking about dark energy, were Mike Turner, Saul Perlmutter, and Brian Green. Saul got the Nobel, one of the winners of the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the dark energy. and. Um, I, I made the one statement is about the only thing we do know about dark, the difference between dark matter and dark energy. <laughs> okay, so I think I'll stop there. Thank you for that fantastic talk, Katie. And now let me please welcome Sean on stage. And OK. Oh, thank you very much. All right. So now um, we have uh, a nice discussion to look forward to. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone can hear me too? Yeah. Thanks, Katie. That was fantastic. The first question is perfectly obvious. Tell us the effort that you made to explain to the Queen of Sweden the energy density of empty space. There's a story oh. there, clearly. Oh, it's a, kind of a long story. Go ahead. We have time. <laughs> um, so I was there for the... Uh, there was a, a conference going along with the Crawford Prize. So there, since there's no Nobel Prize in astronomy, there is a Crawford Prize. And... So I was invited to a conference that went along with that. And at the dinner, I was sitting with the granddaughter of Crawford. And so she wanted, oh yes, I, was, I tried to take a picture of the queen, but I got a potted plant. And, <laughs> You're a and, theoretical and physicist, then, not an experimental. Then, then this, so the grandson of Crawford wanted a picture of himself with one of, the, one of the people at the conference. And so I chopped off their heads. Anyway, so he said, look, come here, I'll introduce you to the queen, okay? So he took pictures of me and the queen that actually worked out just fine. And then it's, so she, she asked me to explain space. <laughs> I thought, oh God, what? I'm like, so I started saying, well, I didn't know, I mean, that, that, there's many ways, to, I don't know what she meant, but anyway, okay, so you leave the earth, you go, past the Earth, you go past the Sun, you go past the galaxy, you get to some average place in the universe. And there the density is 10 to the minus 29 gram per cubic centimeter. <laughs> and she looks at me like, what? <laughs> 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 and so then the conversation went completely cold, okay? I started panicking. So I asked her the most insane question, are you best friends with the Queen of Norway? <laughs> <laughs> no. It is the, you know, and, and her face kind of like, I thought, oh God, what have I done? So I ran away. It turned out that day was the anniversary of the 100th secession of, 100 years secession of Norway from Sweden. <laughs> so, now, I suspect that she didn't really, you know, mind the secession that was 100 years old, but I thought, afterwards, I thought, well, I didn't know what, what happened. They're still annoyed about that. So I, anyway, I ran away. 
<laughs> but it's so it is uh, an amazing concept, right? The energy density of empty space. Explain a little bit. You mentioned that there is dark energy. It's about seventy percent of the universe, uh, and you're saying that there's different candidates for what the dark matter is. But can you say a little bit about the different candidates for what the dark energy could be? Well, that's why you're here. You're <laughs> <laughs> to ask you that question, yes. No, 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 to answer that question. <laughs> well, okay, so I mean, we'll, let's both chime in. Okay. So I mentioned that there is the idea that, there, the, that a vacuum energy could be driving acceleration. Now, when you hear vacuum energy, um, this is a real thing. It's measurable. So what we mean by it is that there are particle-antiparticle pairs that come into existence for a really, really short amount of time and then disappear again. And that there's an energy associated with that behavior. So that's happening in this room and we know it's real. So in fact, people have made measurements. There are parallel plates, conducting plates, and because of the vacuum in between them, they're attracted to each other. Or is it repelled? It depends on, on the details. But so, the, so vacuum energy is a real thing. It's called the, the one I just described. It's called the Casimir effect. It's been measured. And the question is, uh, how much is there in our universe? And if you do the naive calculation that you, you add up for all the particles, the little bit of energy that comes with them, you get an answer that's wrong by 10 to the 120, with 120 being in the exponent. Okay, so there's too much vacuum energy by, in a big way. And that was called, decades ago, was called the cosmological constant problem. The estimate would be that there's much more than we actually have. In the universe, there's not nearly as much vacuum energy as we Yeah, anticipate. the theoretical calculation yeah. gives you a number that's way too large. Right. So people thought, okay, someday we'll figure out how to drive that number to zero. Problem, then, then it's this a fundamental issue. But now it got worse because if the dark energy is a vacuum, it's not zero. It's just a small number, and that's even worse. How the heck are you going to drive a theoretical number that came out to be way too big to give you a little number instead. That's, in fact, we call it the coincidence problem because this vacuum energy was always there, but it was unimportant until just about the time galaxies started to form. That's really weird. Seems fishy, yeah. Very weird. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also possible the vacuum energy is zero, and this dark energy that's making the universe accelerate is just something kind of temporary that is going to fade away eventually. Is that right? Yes, yes. So the other, so I've been talking about the constant vacuum, but there's another possibility. The vacuum could be decaying, and it could, so, you know, I wrote a paper about this in 19, I won't, well, anyway. We won't say, yeah. Well, it's all right. You already know how old I am, but anyway. <laughs> Um, but uh, the modern version is called quintessence, and the idea is that you're, there's a, the vacuum started out big, it's rolling to be smaller and smaller, and eventually asymptoting to zero. So that's possible. And how can we test this idea? Well, there are experiments trying to determine is the amount, uh, is, is the dark energy constant, or is it changing with time? So yeah. there's, there's a number of astronomical surveys. So um, you look at all kinds of different, you, you can look at the growth of clusters, you can look at supernovae, the early supernovae to see what, the, so what they're doing. So all kinds of large scale surveys, the LSST survey that Stockholm University is involved in will be making some of these measurements. You, you add some more. Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's many ways to do it. It's a wonderful yeah. thing that we'll hopefully soon. I mean, you did a wonderful job explaining the experimental efforts to detect dark matter. We're doing the same thing for dark energy. Is it possible that one or either both of these doesn't even exist? Is it possible that we should think about changing gravity rather than adding new stuff to the universe? Well, I would say for dark energy, absolutely. That's very possible, and there's a, a lot of effort in, 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 in doing that. So the, uh, it could be, as I was saying, the Einstein's equations need some tweaking. So in this universe, we only have the, pie, the part of the pie that's the dark matter and the, and the regular matter, and dark energy isn't there at all, but instead the equations have to change. Right. So that is definitely a possibility for the dark energy that I personally would take very seriously. I have, as you know, I have, yeah. we're, we have both worked on that. <laughs> but um, as far as the... Oh, and a lot of people at Stockholm University are working on this kind of, on the, on this kind of stuff, which I think is great. Um, as far as dark matter, no. 
I don't care. <laughs> dark matter is there. I'm sorry. It's There's there. just Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of observational evidence is too powerful, and the alternatives... There's something called MOND, Modified uh -huh. Newtonian Dynamics, where the idea is to explain these rapid, rapid motions of things in galaxies. Well, what if as you move far enough away from the center of the galaxy, Newton's laws even have to change? And so that addition, the, the idea of MOND has now been modified because variants of it didn't match data. And so now there's a new version called Tevis. It has not just, so it adds tensor fields, vector fields, scalar fields, and needs dark matter at this point. Right. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so just so the audience comes away with the right message, dark matter is real. This is what you're telling us. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I think most people, I mean, there are some people who are, that are still, hold, some, some scientists are still working on alternatives, but not a lot. Dark matter, is, dark matter is the right answer. Is We know it's there, but what the heck is it? It's still right. the big right. question. And part of that evidence for that is from the cosmic microwave background. So you didn't talk, talk too Absolutely. much about that. Why yes. don't you explain a little bit more about what we're learning from the cosmic background radiation? Yeah, I mean, that may be the, bi the biggest piece of evidence for the existence of dark matter, actually. So the, oh, it's a little harder to explain, though. But um, in that picture I showed where there was, I said the geometry of the universe has been settled because there's, there was that big finger sticking out at one degree. But if you look at all the other structures in there, then that also tells you about the amount of ordinary matter and the amount of dark matter. Is that really you're forced to having some dark matter in, in that data as well. Right. And just, just explain for, I'm sure the audience is pretty mixed, explain what the microwave background is and where it came from yeah. and how we learn about it. Yeah, I, I thought I had some slides, but I thought I don't have time for all of that. Well, that's but, why we're here. So, okay, if you go really far back in the history of the universe, then it would have been opaque, dark, it, very hot, but also, and all the particles were hitting each other all the time, and so any particle of light Let's say I was, you, 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 as a human, you couldn't be there. But light from you to me wouldn't get that far. It would just immediately scatter, and so you wouldn't be able to see anything. But then when the universe was about 400, wait a minute. 400,000, yeah. Thank you. 400,000 years old. Then, then all of a sudden, hydrogen came into existence, and that means that the, the light, and light doesn't see hydrogen, so it just goes straight through, and we can see back to this 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So right, there was a, we call it um, last scattering. It was the last time the, that photon scattered, and the, that light comes to us. We see it, and now it's microwaves. It's just like the same frequency as your microwave oven, more or less. And we've learned a tremendous amount. So we've learned the geometry of the universe, and also it's the best evidence for dark matter, you said. Is there evidence for dark energy also from the microwave background? Yes, but it's not as sensitive to dark energy as it is to these other things, but yes. So let's, let's be a little bit reflective about this. I mean, we had the pie chart that you showed us, right? And we're only 5% of the universe, and there's 70% dark energy and 25% dark matter. Would you have guessed that the universe was like that if you didn't know, if you weren't forced in that direction by the observations? Well, is this a sensible universe, or is this a crazy universe we live in? Hmm. I mean, of course, I, we, we, we wouldn't have guessed, but is it crazy? No, I don't think it's crazy. You know, there's always, I don't like to think about this, but there's always the possibility <laughs> that we're really wrong about everything. Sure. And so back in the, for thousands of years, Ptolemy the theory, had theories that everybody thought were correct, which is that Wait, how did this work? The Earth was at the center of the universe, and everything else went around it, and the models got more and more complicated. So you'd have epicycles around epicycles, these very complicated things going on to keep the, whatever you do, keep the Earth the center. And then Copernicus, I'm, I'm sure the, the history is more complicated, but Copernicus said, well, what if you, if you put the sun at the center? Oh my God, everything's so simple suddenly. And so maybe what we're doing with dark matter and dark energy, we're, we're kludging our preconceptions by having, we're, they're really epicycles around epicycles, and we're going the, along the wrong track completely. But at least we're not doing it because some religious figure is telling us to. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it possible that one of the particles that we do know about secretly is the dark matter? I mean, is it just dark gas or something like that? How do we know that it requires a whole new particle? 
Well, you know, another, the, the other thing I didn't talk about is, uh, I hope I'm not going to be introducing too many things, but Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So, yeah, please. Okay, when the universe was three minutes old, that's the first time complicated elements started to form. So before that, you had protons and neutrons, but that's it. You didn't, but then at this point, it's three minutes after the Big Bang, all of a sudden things can start making helium, deuterium, more complex structures. By the way, there's a, a popular science book called The First Three Minutes by Steve Weinberg, which is awesome. But anyway, um, so, and then only much later did you make carbon because you needed stars to do that. But so where was I going with this? this is How we know that it's not another particle, that we need another particle to be the dark matter. So we know f f that we have data on the, hel on the amount of helium, we have data on the amount of deuterium, all these things that were produced three minutes after the, after the Big Bang. This is so amazing. They absolutely perfectly match the data, but only if atoms are less than 5% of the universe. So that was, that was already known in the 1980s. It was less than 10% at the time, but this is the earliest, this is a very early piece of evidence that you have to have, that, that atoms cannot really complete right. the universe. So. So 30% so that, that of the universe is matter, and no more yeah. than 5% of it can be ordinary matter, so it well has said. to be something new. Yeah, let's say, let's say it again. <laughs> I'm going to say it again because it's so good, okay? Wait. So we know that 30% of the universe is made of matter, but we know that only 5% can be ordinary matter, so that leaves the other 25% a, a, a conundrum, and yeah. And when we say WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, you alluded to the fact that supersymmetry might be a way to get WIMPs. So yep. tell us a little bit more about what supersymmetry is and where it connects to WIMPs. Okay, so I, I do want to say that WIMPs are a generic category and supersymmetry is one of the ways to get them. Right. But the way that, uh, so, uh, super, I mean, yeah, she's such a big subject, I don't know, I don't know where to begin, but. Um, You've been doing great so far. You always say it takes too much time, but. Supersymmetry, you already mentioned it, right? There's partners for every particle. What, why would anyone ever think that? What crazy person would uh, come up with such a scheme? So there are unanswered problems in particle physics. Um, one of them is why, if you, do naive, if you do naive calculations, then all particles should be really, really, really heavy, and they're not. And one of the ways to protect against that is by having supersymmetry. So the, for all the quarks, like we have quarks, up, down quarks, da, 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 da. So then all of a sudden you have squarks. You put an S in the front, or for the Higgs, you have a Higgsino. You put an Eno at the end. So for so, but and you need and you need these additional particles to cancel things out to protect the, all these particles from be, from everything from becoming really really heavy. And I think that was kind of hard to explain, but. That, that, so there's theoretical, very deep theoretical motivation for thinking that supersymmetry should be there, and it should be. There should be particles that are around the kind of masses we're talking about for WIMPs, too, because right. the physics we're talking about is at, at the same mass scale of about 100 times the mass of the proton. So there's a lot of motivation for, for thinking this is a really, these are really good candidates. I think that a lot of times people in the public, they hear these words like supersymmetry and dark matter and dark energy, and they, it kind of sounds like we're just making stuff up. But I think you do an excellent job in sort of saying that we're driven to these, yeah. both by the data that uh. we see and by the theoretical issues that we're trying to figure out. I mean, we don't just invent supersymmetry and WIMPs. They, they are the best explanations we have for what yeah. we see. Well, there is, I mean, I think I've indicated the amount of data that are driving us to believe that these categories have to exist, like dark matter has to exist. There's yeah. too much data that tells you it's there. And then, uh, then we have, on the theory side, a lot of mathematics to back up why we're studying some of these candidates rather than others. And on, on, this, on the case of WIMPs, well, I mean, there are four, four fundamental forces that we absolutely know about. Nature has exactly four, and there's only one of them that could be helpful for the dark matter, and that is this weak interaction. And if you postulate that, and then these particles are their own antimatter, so they annihilate in the early universe until the universe spreads out, they can't find each other anymore. So if they annihilate with, these, with a weak strength, a weak interaction, then you get the right amount of dark matter today. So that's mathematics telling you that this idea of using a weak, a weak force gave you something good as far as a dark matter candidate. 
And so the word supersymmetry kind of reminds us of the word superstring theory, right? Does string theory have anything to teach us about these issues? No. <laughs> about dark matter, no. No. I don't think so. Do you? No, but I'm asking the questions. You, this, <laughs> I have the easy part, remember? That's, that was our bargain. No, no, but it was a debate too, right? So you're allowed to have a, a, a no. It's, um, Do you need to think about string theory at all in your, in your research? So, in, in the model of dark energy that I came up with, that was based on the idea of having additional dimensions, and that certainly was because of string theory. And so, in string theory, you, our universe could be a three-dimensional surface embedded in higher dimensions, and somewhere else there could be another surface. And so, what, what, what we realized is that, well, the, depending on what's in between us and the other surface, it could be pulling on our universe, our three-dimensional surface, and causing weird behavior that looks like dark energy. So you'd have only ordinary, you'd only have matter and so forth, the ordinary stuff existing in the universe, but the equations would change. And so that was motivated by string theory, for example. So yes, sometimes it allows us. So there are co cosmological implications. There are perhaps, cosmological for impl theory. implications of extra dimensions, of, anyway. Of extra dimensions, yes. And Oscar Klein invented them, so we're happy to. Oh, talk we about have that. to say that yes. Oscar Klein <laughs> invented extra dimensions. That's right, because he wanted to. The one of the big holy grails unify all those four forces. We know how to do it with three of them, but the big one we don't know what to do, to do with is gravity. Gravity, yeah. That's a really hard one, and in the attempt to unify gravity and electromagnetism, this is where the Kaluza-Klein theory was really brilliant, and it took you to extra dimensions. It's brilliant. Why don't you say a little bit about what the theory is? How did Klein get rid of these extra dimensions? Why don't we see them? Oh, so they could be very, very small. So, for example, if you look at the carpet, it looks like, you know, it's flat. But if you look closely enough, it might, you might see some of them have little rings, you know? Some of the, the carpet weave has little rings. So if you were small enough, you could go running around in that weave. And so those, these extra dimensions could be curled up like that. And so we're, we're not aware of them because they're too tiny. But they're, so at every point here, there, there could be, what, six of them yeah. running around? Six little dimensions that we are not aware of? And are we looking for them? Are we going to find them? Absolutely, the Large Hadron Collider <laughs> will create particles that disappear into them. All right, <laughs> that is something we're thinking about, yes. <laughs> uh, so while we have you here, let's just like, we're nearing the end of it, but let's get some quick hits on all, I think that to you and me, you do dark matter, that's a thing that you do in cosmology, you do dark energy, but there's a whole bunch of ideas that are related to each other. Why is there more matter than antimatter? in the universe. Is that something you think about? Well, that's, a, that's one of the big unanswered problems. So there, yeah. there's... Does okay. it relate to dark matter, maybe? It might, yeah. So the, just to put it in perspective, so we, we know that in the universe, for every particle of antimatter, there are a billion particles of matter. So there's a million times as much matter as antimatter. But we don't know why. So if you start out in the universe with equal amounts of both, it's very hard to generate this asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Um, but so people do tie this into the idea of, of dark matter, so asymmetric dark matter. Well, I mean, if you think about it, it's a little weird because there's almost the same amount of matter as dark matter in the sense that if dark matter weighed, let's say dark matter particles weighed five times as much as the proton, well, then you'd end up with five times as much dark matter as ordinary matter, which is exactly what you see. If they're the same number of particles The same each. number of particles, all you have to do is invent, have some new particle that weighs five times as much, so it's not crazy at all in that sense. Right. So there might so. be some relationship in the very early universe that made dark matter and ordinary matter at the same time that we don't know about yet. Yes. Mm -hmm. do, you have an, do you have an opinion about what happened at the very, very beginning of the universe? Why there was a Big Bang at all? I do think that uh, uh, inflation, inflationary cosmology smells right to me. So this was a very, when the universe was really, really, really a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, or some people, that's a question of terminology. But anyway, so there could have been a vacuum energy back then also that cause an accelerated expansion, and we need it to explain a lot of things we see today. Why is the, the microwave background has almost the same temperature everywhere, but these regions could never have talked to each other unless you had an, 
of something that took small regions and blew them up. So small regions that did look identical, you blow them up to be very big, and then you can, ex so an early inflation solves a lot of problems. And so, I, and, and it makes predictions for microwave background data, among other things, that come out really one after the next that is matching very well. So I do think there's something to inflationary cosmology. Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very early period in the universe. I mean, you can always ask, however far back you go, you can always ask, yeah, but what about before that? Yeah. <laughs> so, and then for that matter, the, why is time moving forward? So that's a very weird thing that you have thought about a lot more than I have. I have. Maybe at the 20th anniversary, I'll get invited to give a public lecture about that. Uh, okay, do you think, if you were to bet, do you think within 10 years we'll have found the dark matter? Do you think we'll know what it is? That's always a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> You're being filmed, don't forget. <laughs> so, so we will know within five years whether Dama actually found dark matter or not. And so I'm... Good. So I'm hoping for something exciting there. So you're hoping, you, you think there's a good chance that it could be true? I'm, I'm, I'm not there's gonna, a chance. I'm not, there's a chance. I'm okay. not going to take bets on good. that. Okay. I don't know what to think. But we're, but the but experiments so are moving forward. But we're making major progress. Yeah. We're going to answer that one way or the other. So okay. that we'll know. Um, there are other candidates we didn't even talk about, sterile neutrinos, and there are some, there's some hints of data there, and da, da 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 so I think the next 10 years look very promising. I also want to find dark stars, but for that to happen, the James Webb Space Telescope has to actually launch, and it has been delayed over and over again. But we're hopeful within 10 years it'll be up there, is that right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping they find something. So dark stars, dark matter, plausible within 10 years. Yes. All right. I'll I think say plausible, yes. Plausible is good. That's all yes. we can ask for. I think yes, that's a that's great place, an optimistic for. note on which to end. Let's thank Katie yes. again for wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that fantastic and wide-ranging and mind-blowing discussion. Um, and I hope you've learned a lot tonight as you go out into the dark universe. Thank you.